Usman Davo. Affirm that. Affirm that. I will speak the truth. I will speak the truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we start, I'd just like to take you through some of the rules. There is simultaneous uh, interpretation going on as we speak. So I'll request that you speak at a slow pace and you wait for three seconds between the time I'll ask the question and the time you'll answer it. And I will do the same for you as well. All right, thank you. And I'll also request that you shorten your answers just to enable us um, to get to all that you're saying. The topics I'd like to cover with you today are number one, your biographical details, so as to know who you are as a person, and your educational background, your career as a journalist with respect to the incidents of harassment and violations that you witnessed or you heard of, the arrest of Chief Mane and other related issues, and finally we'll deal with the impact these incidents have on your life and that of your family. Can we start now? All right, thank you. Can you please state your full names? My name is Usman Davo, commonly known as Pa Usman Davo. Where do you live currently? I live in Washington State, Seattle, Washington State, United States of America. Can you please tell us your date of birth, when and where you were born? I was born in Buren Village East on the 22nd of February, 1973. Can you please give us a brief detail of your educational background from your primary to your secondary school? I enrolled at Bremen Primary School 1980 to 1988, where I sat to the common entrance examination, then to Pagalindin Secondary School in 89, and I sat to the common entrance there again, went to Tahir Ahmedia Muslim High School, and graduated in 1995. After your graduation, what did you do? After my graduation, I taught as a teacher briefly. And uh, from there, I joined NARI, National Agricultural Research Council. From 1998 to 99. Thereafter, what did you do? Thereafter, I joined the, uh, the Daily Observer newspaper in 19. 99. What was your position when you joined the Daily Observer? I was a, I started as a freelance reporter and I rose to the rank of uh, staff reporter in 2001. As at the time you started off at Daily Observer, what kind of stories were you covering? I covered that of the court cases, uh, the political uh, interviews and political coverage of all political parties in the Gambia and also as an investigative reporter. We have had evidence of um, harassment and violations suffered by journalists during the former regime. Can you please give us a brief recap of what you witnessed or heard during your days as a journalist with respect to those violations and harassment? While I was working at the Daily Observer, under the editor of uh, the editor in chief of Sri Bojan Senior, uh, hello. Go ahead, please. As a as a reporter, I was working under directly under Sri Bojan Senior, who is the current uh, owner of the Standard newspaper, and then from there. While I was there, Buba Balde became our managing director. Under the leadership of Buba, uh, Buba Balde, they told us that the editorial independence, they interfere with our editorial independence. And then from there, 
I mean, we decided to resign. The, the editorial board, 12 members of us resigned from the Daily Observer in 2001, precisely in June. What did you mean when you said they interfered with your editorial independence? We were told by late Buba Balde that we are not allowed to publish any article on opposition members, uh, mostly that of uh, lawyer Usenu Dabo and Lamin Wajwara. Did he tell you who specifically said that you were not allowed to cover stories relating to the opposition? We had a staff meeting and Buba Balde informed us accordingly. So because of that, we said, no, we can't do that as a newspaper. We should allow all political parties or any citizens to give their comments and opinions. So that didn't go well with And uh, uh, Junior interviewed Lamin Wajwara in 2001 when we, I mean, produced, uh, artic the article was produced and it didn't go well with Buba Balde. He said, we have to adhere to what he says or we all resign. So we decided to resign. Please, for clarification's sake, can you please uh, state the name of the person that interviewed Wajuara? Safe Bojan Junior. By, by Wajuara, do you mean Lamin Wajuara? Yes, ma'am. Did anything happen to Shirif, Mr. Fa Did anything happen to Shirif as a result of that interview? No, nothing actually happened to him. We stand by him and uh, we stood by him and uh, we decided to resign. How many of you in total resigned as a result of that interference? Twelve members of the editorial board. The twelve of you that resigned, did you continue working as journalists or did you pursue other careers? We continue as journalists, and uh, I think uh, Pa Khalifa Sanyang then went to uh, KMC as their PRO. How about you? What did you do? I joined the independent newspaper as a freelance reporter in 2001. Can you tell us at that time what the editorial policy of the independent paper was? The independent newspaper is a private-owned newspaper owned by Baba Gale Jalof, Yoro, Alaji Yoro Jalof, and uh, the editorial independence of the paper was intact. During your time at the independent, did you witness any incidents of interference? No. About harassment? We do, in, uh, from the government size, yes, we do. But within the editorial, I mean, the, the management, no. But with the government size, we have been harassed several times. The independent office was burned. Uh, and then the printing machine was also burned by the junglers, led by uh, Bombardier. But during the burning of the printing machine, Sana, Sana, Sana Manjang was the one who got burned. And he threw his pistol there. The pistol was later hand over to the inspector, the then inspector general of police, Tatin Baji, who told us that that pistol is made in was made in France, and uh, it could be used by criminals. During those incidents that you've mentioned, were you present? Uh, when the office was burned, it was burned during the night. It was only one side of the building that was burned on the MDI road. So, How but our production you? department, headed by Namori Trawale, was the one in charge of the production of the paper. They were the one at the at the at the time of the printing when the junglers came there to burn the uh, the printing machine. You mentioned that it was the junglers that burnt the printing press. How do you know that? Uh, because we did an investigation and uh, it so find out that Sanamanjang, who was part of the junglers, was among the people who came to the independent uh, uh, office, uh, sorry, the independent printing uh, department and burned the place. He was taking refuge in Bajinka, late Khalifa Bajinka's house at mile 7. Can you tell us who 
went about that investigation you're talking about? I did it myself together with Alaji Yorajalo. And uh, when we found out that uh, from the sources close to the military medics told us that, I mean, certain people among the military medics we are going to Bajinka's house to treat Sanamanjang of the, of the bond. Who was Alaji Yorajalo at that time? Alaji Yorajalo was the managing editor of the independent newspaper. Can you situate this incident with time, please? Tell us when it occurred. It happened in 2000, if I didn't forget, well, I think it happened in 2001. Did anything come out of the investigations that you did, you and Alajiro? When we did our investigation, I had wanted to publish the article, but because of the sensitive nature of it, I mean, we informed a National Assembly member, Mr. Hamad Ba, at the time. And then Hamad Ba came to the National Assembly, made the pronouncement for the investigations to be held. But at that time, when he mentioned it before the National Assembly, Fatumada Jahumpa Sise, a nominated member, told the then Speaker of the House, Sirif Mustafa Adiba, to use his uh, discretion so that the media would not publish that I mean, uh, article. But Sirif, he, she was told by Sirif Mustafa Adiba that he has no right to interfere with what journalists are supposed to write or not what to write. And who was Sheriff Mustafa Diba at this time? He was the Speaker of the National Assembly. Were you present when that allegations were made at the National Assembly? Yes, I was there for independent newspaper. So you clearly heard what Fat Jahumpa said with respect to the allegations that was narrated by Hamad Ba? Yes. Thereafter, what happened? Thereafter, we went and published the article together with the gun that was left. We, because we took the picture of the gun that was left at the uh, at printing department. In which paper was the article published? It was published in most uh, most of the newspapers, both uh, independent, the Daily Observer, uh, the Point newspaper, and the Fourier newspaper. Was the matter ever reported to the police? The matter was reported to the police. They know about it, but they didn't do anything about it. How do you know that it was actually reported to the police? Because the police came into the scene. Sorry, can you repeat that again? The police came to the scene to do their investigations. During the process of their investigations, did they interview anyone with respect to the incident? Yes, they, I believe they interviewed uh, Namori Trawale and others. This particular arson attack, did it affect the independent paper in any way with respect to production yes, of it its articles? Yes, it does affect us. Yes, it does affect us. Can you tell us about that? Because we used to print at the Daily Observer. Then we are there. The Observer management says that I gave the order to the production department not to allow the independent newspaper uh, to be printed there. So from there, we shift to the point newspaper who are helping us with our productions or printing. After this particular incident, and after reporting about it on the papers, did you give your findings to the police with respect to what you found out about uh, the person that got burnt? No, because it was uh, uh, said at the National Assembly. And when it, because it was said by Hamad Ba, they couldn't arrest him because he was a sitting member of the National Assembly. And he was, I mean, uh, his rights to say those things were backed by the Constitution of the Gambia. In your own opinion, what would you say was the conduct of the police with respect to the incident that happened at the printing press? It was a negligence of their duty 
to fulfill the safety and to make sure that all Gambians are safe while in the, Gamb while in the Gambia. They affect us. What do you think the intention was in burning down the printing place? So they could cripple the production of independent newspaper and we would be going out of the business. Did they succeed in doing that? Eventually, in the later years to follow, yes, they did. Apart from this particular incident, did you witness any other incident as well? Yes, I witnessed the incident at the Banjul International Airport when the, people, the Gambians were coming from Mecca after performing the Hajj and we are welcomed by the then Minister of Interior, Usman Baji, whose wife and the girlfriend fought at the airport while the pilgrims were there. And the girlfriend was admitted at Royal Victoria Hospital. And did you write an article with respect to this story? Yes, this article was published by independent newspaper, and that didn't go well with Usman Baji. What do you mean by it didn't go well with Usman Baji? He called at the office and there were a lot of threatening remarks that he made against the managing editor and the editorial board. I mean that uh, we're trying to interfere into the private business. At one time they denied the story, but I mean that we got the pictures at that time of uh, the fight and uh, the, the girlfriend was injured through the neck and was admitted at the hospital. Were you the one that received uh, the phone call when he called? No, normally when they call, it's normally the receptionist who received the call and will pass it either to uh, the managing editor when he's available. If not, they will hand it over to the journalist available at the office. You come to hear about the threatening remarks, the words, the actual words he used. Uh, when that happens, we just continue and then uh, we publish all what he has said again and then there was an editorial uh, write-up and uh, this was published again by the independent newspaper. Did he eventually know who wrote that particular article? Yes, I, uh, together with another colleague of mine, if I didn't forget, I think it was Makalo, then we write the article. Makalo, are you referring to? Suleiman Makalo. As a result of that article, did anything happen to you or Suleiman Makalo? Actually, nothing happened to us per se, but after that article was I mean, published, I wrote an article on incident remarking to Alpha Khan in August of 2002. Sorry, you said you wrote an article about who's married to Alpha Khan? The then Vice President of the Gambia, Aysarunjai Sedi, remarried to Alpha Khan. What happened as a result of that article? When the article coincided with the one year anniversary of the late husband, Jay Sedi, and when this article came out, I was arrested on the 2nd of August 9, 2002. That particular article you wrote, was there any truth in it? Yes, it was truthful and it's still truthful uh, still now because uh, when we uh, independent published that article, neither the vice president nor Alpha Khan came to our office to deny that article. However, as a result of that article, you were arrested, right? Yes, I was arrested by the personnel of the Na National Intelligence Agency. Can you tell us how you were arrested and where? I was arrested right at the, in the office of the uh, independent newspaper. Immediately I arrived at, at work. One of my colleagues told me that, I mean, there were four people who were asking for me. He told me he gave them my number. I said, did you know them? I said, how can you give my number to people? without knowing who they are. So he said, I think they are here, they are not far. Then he went to the shop, he saw them there and told them that Pausman is at the office. So the NIS came to the office 
and asked if I am Pausman Dabo. I said, yes. They said, we want to see you. I gave them the chair to sit. They said, no, we want you to go out with us. I said, no, who are you? Then they refused to identify themselves. Then one of them was, had a pen and paper and wrote there, you are wanted at the serious crime unit for questioning. I said, but may I know who you are, sir? He said, I can't tell you my name, but you'll come to know us. I said, if that's the case, then I'm not going. Then one of them came in by the name Jagan. The last name was Jagana. I came to know his name while we were driving to Banjul at the NI headquarters through his bangle that he put on his hand. So when I gave him the seat, he they refused to sit down. Then he, the guy was writing serious crime, and then this other guy said, NIA, I said, if you don't tell me the specific place, I am not going with you. Then Jagana spoke in all of that you seem to be very stubborn, but when we get to the NIA, you're going to see what we're going to do to you. I replied, the one could do is to kill me, and then every human being must taste the pains of death. As at the point so, that they were arresting you, did they identify themselves to you either as NIA or as serious crime police? Mambabu was the one who wrote on the, on the paper that uh, I was going to the uh, serious crime unit, but they did not identify themselves. Did they tell you the reason why you should follow them? Uh, no, they didn't tell me any reason. What happened when they asked you to follow them? When that happened, I said, okay, can you allow me to park my stuff? He said, okay, that's fine, but please don't tell your people that you are arrested. I said, okay, fine with me. I'm not going to tell anybody. Then it was uh, Julde Balde and uh, uh, the cleaner who were in, at the office. So I went to Julde. I said, Julde, can you please uh, tell your Jalo that I have been picked up by the NIA for questioning? So when he overheard me talking to Julde, he said, but you promised that you're not going to tell them you are arrested. I said, yes, but I didn't tell him that to tell Yoro that I'm arrested. All what I said was, let him inform Yoro that I've been picked up for questioning at the NI. He said, oh, oh, you are right, you are right, you are not being arrested, you are right. So that's how we went. And uh, we walked towards uh, MDI route, the park, opened the door for me to enter, I to go at the back to get my kids. I will know actually uh, the vehicle that I'm going to board. At that point, what was the difference between being arrested and being picked up? Well, it's a use of language and wording because I tried to fake them that I did because I told them I'm not going to tell uh, police that I'm arrested. So I decided to use the word picked up. Which buff? Upon your arrival at the NIA, can you tell us what happened? So on the way to the NIA, I had my phone with me. They asked if I had a phone. I said yes. So they said they told me to turn the phone off. While I was trying to turn it off, I put it on mute and decided to text Yorajalo that I've been picked up by the NIA. Then arrive, on arrival at the NIA, I was first taken to the office of Ibrahim Akinte as, the invest, uh, as their lead investigator. From there, I was taken to Captain Lamin Singh's office. He's one. Can you please tell us what happened at from the time you entered the NIA? What happened at the first office, and what happened at Lamin Singh's office? When I entered into Ibrahim Akinda's office, we greeted each other and asked me to uh, sit down. I sat for a while. They didn't tell me anything. And then later, Mambabu, who came to arrest me at the independent office, walked me to Captain Lamin Singh's office. Captain Lamin Singh is a, was a blind man, or is a blind man. He got injured during a granite explosion in Farafenye. I believe it was in 1996. Did Lamin Singh do or say anything to you when you arrived at his office? Yes, when I arrived at his office, they gave me a chair to share, which I did, and he asked me, what's your name? I said, my name is Usman Dabo, but some call me Paus. Most people call me in the media as Paus Dabo.
He said, are you a journalist? I said, yes. Working for independent newspaper? I said, yes. He asked me, did you see the, uh, the trade the production? I said, I replied, yes. And he said, are you the author? I said, yes. I stood by the story. And then there, from there, the marathon inter uh, interrogation started. What did the marathon interrogation entail? He asked me, why did I write the story of Vice President remarrying to Alpha Khan? But first, he asked me what was the role of a what uh, what was the role as a uh, for one to be a journalist. I said, as a journalist, we are our role is to inform, educate, and entertain the public because we are the watchdogs of the society. And then he says, in this article, did you entertain or did you inform? The public. I said I informed the public about the vice president married to Alpha Khan since the late husband Jay Sedi died of a protracted. Sorry, can you repeat that again? There was a breakage. You said since the late husband. Since the late husband Jay Sedi passed away, the vice president has been single, and then he was uh, she was married to Alpha Khan. Go ahead. Then he said to me. Does the public need to know that? I said, yes, the public need to know. Because the vice president, I said, I said it, was public is a public figure. And as a public figure occupying a public office, you don't have any privacy backed by the Constitution of the, backed by the 1997 Constitution of the Gambia. Then he said to me, what benefit do you get from publishing this article. I said, there is no benefit, but I'm trying to inform the public that the vice president married uh, to uh, Alpha Khan because the late husband died of a protracted illness. So when I mentioned the protracted illness, he said to me, so are you telling the whole, you are, in your article, you also stated that the, the late husband, Jay said he died of a protracted illness. That means you are telling people that the vice president might be suffering from HIV and AIDS. I said, no, we argued. I told him that protracted illness means the late husband died of a long illness that he has been suffering with. So protracted there means long. He said to me, no, you are telling the people that vice president might be having HIV and AIDS. I said, that's your opinion. But I've never wrote in an article that the vice president is suffering from HIV and AIDS. So from that inter from that interrogation you went through with Sen, Mr. Sen, what did you think the problem was in your article? The problem they had. I think the problem, I think the problem was like uh, most of them were not aware of the vice president remarried to Alpha Khan and for the fact that it coincided with the one year anniversary of the late J. Sedi in which the government officials and other uh, Islamic scholars were there doing the recitation. Uh, recitation of the Quran for the late husband. After interrogating you, were you released? No, I was not released. I was. Uh, they gave me some uh, time to break. Time to break. Then after the break, we continue. Uh, I think a day I might I will write like four to five statements every day. I was detained there till on the second. Oh, sorry, on the 3rd of August 2002, when they brought in Fatima Jabi, who was pregnant at the time, was arrested by the NIA. He was escorted there by his ex-husband, Lamin Sane, alias Tintin. Fatima Jabi is the current first lady of Sierra Leone. Do you know why they brought her there at the NIA? No, I have no clue actually why they brought her there, but I overheard Tintin speaking to uh, the NIS that they asked him, why are you here, Tintin? He said he was there with their wife. The wife has been called there for questioning, and they are there to I mean, the answer to the NIS call. Do you know for how long she was at the NIA? If I didn't forget, she spent the whole, that day at the NIA and was released the following day. While she was arrested, I mean, I was out at night. I was out with the NIS in their lobby. We were doing attire. 
and uh, during that time i told one of them to help me with a pen and a paper some of them were very nice to me and uh, a paper and a pen was given to me i wrote the story of fatima jabi being arrested by the nia and i used a pen name called jalaman jame which i sent one of the officers I told, I told him this is a letter can you please to your jealous house but be careful he agreed and dropped that letter to the uh, i dropped my articles to the independent newspaper which was published if i get you right you mentioned that you were given a paper and a pen by one of the officers that you are friendly with and Yes. You wrote an article with respect to the arrest of Fatima Jabi and the husband. And you wrote yes. it under the pen name Jalambang Jame. Jalambang 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 Jame. Jalama Jame. Yes. Who delivered the article for you? One of the NIS delivered to for me at the independent office. Was that article published? Yes, it was published by the independent newspaper on the uh, 5th of August 2002. At that time, who was this Lamin Sane you are talking about? Lamin Sane used to live in Europe. So he is from uh, Bacau. But he's not in the Gambia as Tintin. You mentioned that Fatima Jabi was detained there for one day. Can you tell us yes. under which condition and she was pregnant? Can you tell us yes, under which condition she was kept? Uh, she was not put in a cell. She was I mean at the uh, at their front office and from there they took him to another, they took her to another office and uh, from there the following day on Sunday she came there on Saturday and that was the odd very day, Alaji Yorojalo was also invited for questioning in connection to the article I published on Vice President. You told us about the detention of uh, Fatima Jabi, and now you've mentioned that Alaji Yorojalo was also called and questioned with respect to the same article you wrote concerning the Vice President. Was he released that day that he was called there? Yes, he was released the very day. He came there with one of my colleagues, Lamin Diba. Can you tell us the condition of your detention while you were at the NIA? While I was at the NIA, I mean, they would come and interrogate. It's Captain Sin, in particular, will come and uh, ask me the source of my informant, which I refused to give. And then on Saturday, Fode Bari came inside the office and said to me, my friend, give us the name of this person and we will let you go. I said, no, I can't give you the source of my informant because as a journalist, we are supposed to protect our informants. So he said, if you didn't tell us, we know how to get information from you guys because we're going to end up torturing you but nonetheless i was adamant not to give the source of my informant and uh, i was detained there from the second to the fifth that i spent three days there and then at night when uh, some of those nis who were so kind to me will get me out from this cell take a shower have dinner with them, drink some attire, and between the hours of four and five, they will ask, they will pull me back into the cell. While you so were when you came, the, sorry, while you were detained at the NIA, were you at any point tortured? No, I was not tortured. Physically, I was not tortured. Were you threatened? Yes, there were threats made by Fode Bari and Captain Lamin said. Apart from Fatima Jabi, who you said you saw and was detained for one day, did you witness any other persons that were detained at the NIA during your pe the period you were there? Yes, I witnessed the arrest uh, 
I saw the people from this place, uh, Yundum and uh, Busumbala, who were arrested by the NIAs and brought into the office. Some of the, those people met with were detained there for more than one or two months what they did so my apologies uh, mr dabo i apologize for cutting you we didn't hear the statements that you made because the line was breaking can you please repeat what you said while i was at the nia i found some people there who were arrested and detained there for more than a month or so without being charged or bailed and uh, the same same time, people from Busumbala and Yundum who were brought into the NIA office. Do you know, in connection with what, what incident, those people were kept there? They were arrested in connection with theft of uh, fuel that they used to go to uh, the civil aviation fuel tank and we drew some I mean, fuel, put it in, 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 the, in, the, in the 20 liter gallons, and we'll go and resell it. Well, some of them, according to them, told me that they worked with uh, civil aviation as security guards, but they've not been paid for like one or two months, and the Tabaski was coming at the time, so they don't have an option, but rather to steal fuel and resell it. So during that process, they were caught by the NIA. And I had one of the NIA officers I forgot that name, but I knew he completed from Amitage High School. He said, I mean, I overheard him saying to the NIA police that when they found these people with a pipe that they connected to the fuel tank that would pass through the uh, the 20 liter, that they put through the 20 liter gallon, that he opened fire to the people and some of them fell. They were able to I mean, guard them. During the three days period that you were at the NIA, did you witness anyone being tortured? No, I did not witness anyone being tortured among them. Can you tell us what eventually led to your release? Uh, it was on Monday around uh, 4 p.m. that Captain Lamin Sain told me that we we're going to, I mean, release you. But before then, he asked me to write another statement, which I did. And in my statement, I made it categorically clear that since they are intelligent officers, their is to investigate when people do wrong. So I told why don't you people go and investigate this story? If the story is not true, please let them take legal action against me. He told me that the vice president was not interested to prosecute any journalist for the fact that the late husband was a journalist himself. After your release, did you continue working with the independent paper? Yes, when immediately I was released, I took a call and then went to an independent office. I called Alaji Yorojalo that I was released and I went to their office. And I, I mean, explained my ordeal to them, which was also published subsequently. Then from there, on the, the following day, on the 6th of August 2002, I was called by Captain Sain to report myself to the NIA, which I complied. And what was the reason for calling you back to the NIA? Uh, when I arrived there, surprisingly again, we started. they started interrogating me whether I stand uh, by my story. I said, yes, the story is true. There is nothing, I mean, that we said in this story, that is not correct. But as I said before, I'm still maintaining my stand, that is, investigate. If it's not true, prosecute me. What eventually happened to that case? Nothing actually happened. I was there then that, uh, on the 6th of August, around 6 p.m. They told me to get somebody to bail me. So I called a friend of mine who also used to work with a newspaper, from the Gambia Daily, or who came and bailed me. But I was never charged or prosecuted. After that particular incident, were you involved in any other incident, or did you witness any other incident of harassment or violation? After that incident, 
I think it was in 2003, again, I was called by the major crime unit that I should report to them they, uh, for questioning. I went there. At the time, it was uh, late uh, Nuha, Kujabi, Nuha Kujabi, if I didn't forget his name. He later became the IG, but he's late now. Said that they are interested to know the people I communicated with. Particularly, there is a number that they print out from the uh, from the official company that I've been talking with that person for a lot, quite a number of time, together with one Safiya Tuba who used to work with Daily Observer. When now I say who that person is, they never mentioned the name of that person, but they saw the number to me. It's an official number. Said I always talk to that person, and it's an interest to them, so they want me to help them to locate that person. I said I cannot locate the person who I did not know. A statement was taken from me and they let me go. Did they tell you why they wanted to locate that person? No, they didn't tell me that. Did you find out anything about that particular incident? No, I did not. And after that, what happened? Then after that, I continued with the independent newspaper until, uh, if I don't forget, I think it was 2003 again. That the president, the ex-president, Yaya Jame, ordered animals from South Africa for his zoo in Kanilai. So I decided to go to Kanilai to get whether it's something true. A, a cargo flight came from South Africa to draw, I mean, bring animals for Jame's zoo. And when I upon arrival at Kanilai, I found with, with the GSS was also there. They ordered over 100 crocodiles for his pool, three lions, three wildebeest, 365 species of different birds that were brought to the zoo. And this article was also published by the independent newspaper. Did anything happen to you as a result of that article being published? Did anything happen to you as a result of that article being published? No. For how long did you continue working for the independent paper after that? I worked with independent till like uh, 2004 when we were called by uh, Serif Bojan Sr., the current uh, proprietor of Standard Newspaper that he's been appointed as the managing director of Daily Observer newspaper. And he wants us to go there to revive the paper's independent, uh, editorial independence at the same time to help to generate income because Observer, under the uh, tenure of Buba Balde, they were running at a loss and it was hard for them to pay their staff at that time because people were not buying the paper. And uh, when you went back to in the, when you went back to the observer, did you have that independence with respect to the stories that you pursued? Yes, we had that independence because Sirif was a free, independent-minded around. April or June. My apologies, Mr. Dawa. The line just keeps breaking, so you have to start from where you started answering the question. Steve Bojang is a free indi uh, individual who believed in the editorial independence of any newspaper. Hello, Mr. So, Dawa. Here. I'm sorry for cutting you again, but the line was breaking as well. Can you please repeat your answer once more? Serif Bojan is a friend who believes in the editorial independence of any newspaper, and he was not interfering with the activities of the editorial board. 
And for how long did Sheriff Bojan continue as the head of the independent paper? Uh, almost like uh, two years, I think, if I can remember, almost two years. But while Sheriff was there, there was another incident that happened. Tell us about it. Uh, this was in connection with one Lamin Jai who came from, I think, I believe it was in Germany or Switzerland. He came to Gambia on a vacation. So the uh, vice president's convoy shot at him around the independent stadium while they were uh, driving to Banjul. They said he obstructs the traffic. And what happened? He was admitted at the uh, intensive care unit of the Royal Victoria Hospital. So people heard of the gunshots and uh, the journalists were all trying to know what really happened. So we, most of us were informed that they shot somebody who was at the uh, intensive care unit of the RVH. But I mean, the, the place was guarded by armed soldiers because they don't want anybody to access him to interview him. So I told Sheriff that I won't try to get this story. He said, I so I said, yes. Then I spoke to one of the uh, nurses who at the time was also a police officer. I mean, I spoke with him. He said, yes, he's here in our office. He's been admitted at RBH here. I said, I want to interview him. He said, we have security officer, uh, guards here. It's going to be hard for you to come in here. I said, okay, I will try my best. Then we discussed at length. I told him to place a gown that the, the, the doctors or the surgeons will use at the door. And then I dressed myself with a, with a colleague of mine from the independent newspaper. I dressed myself into that doctor's gown with my recorder on. I entered at the ICU unit, interviewed that Lamin Jai, and then the story was published. When the, public, uh, the story came out, the protocol of the vice president at the time if I didn't forget, it was Pujobate. And then call at the office that we should not have, I mean, uh, published that article. And that they threatened Lamin Jai again, and they asked him whether he spoke to any journalist. He said no. Then I played the, the Sheriff played the, uh, the audio that I recorded with Lamin Jai when I interviewed him to Pujobate. And Puy told them that yes, this journalist penetrated the, uh, the security. And they interviewed Lamin Jai, and he had listened to that interview. Did you eventually publish that article? The article was published. And uh, Steve was very happy how I was able to penetrate the security officers standing at the ICU was as a doctor. Was the government happy about that article? No, they were not happy about it. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, we got what we wanted, and the interview was held. And fortunately for us, we have the record in the recorder. The voice of Lamin Jai. After that particular incident, did Sheriff Bojan continue to be the editor-in-chief of the paper? I think it was later that year he was relieved of his duties, and then Buba Balde came in as the, sorry, and uh, Sajatal came in as the managing director. What do you think led to him being relieved of his duties? I believe it is in connection to the, uh, the editorial independence that was lost and regained. They feel that, I mean, the observer is going too much. We are not advocating for APRC and Yajamet's agenda. You said who took over after Sheriff Boya? Dr. Sajatal. Can you please tell us about Dr. Sajatal when he took over the, uh, the Observer paper? When Sajatal was appointed as the managing director of the Daily Observer, we had a staff meeting in the presence of Nene Magdolgay and uh, late Momodu Sanya. So he, I mean, briefed us, I mean, as the they briefed us uh, because they were part of the board. 
they brief us that I mean Sajatal is been is our new managing director, and anything he is the one uh, we should get I mean the advice from. So we complied, and uh, during that meeting, I remember vividly that Ibrahim Jaumani asked Doctor Sajatal why did he accept that job. Sajatal says he came there purposely to was the observer is owned by Yaya Jami, and that he was there to promote the welfare of Jammeh's agenda and that of the APRC. And what was your response, you and your colleagues, what, what, what was your response to what he said? Well, when he came there first, at one time he threatened us that, I mean, uh, he told us that, I mean, he came with 11 people that he was told to fire, but he's going to give us the benefit of the doubt. Well, they align us to be UDP supporters. Sorry, did I hear you say that he said he came with a list of people that he in, that are intended to be fired, right? Yes, 11 people, including okay. myself. Did he fire those 11 people, including yourself? Uh, he fired some of the people, but before, I mean, reaching even five people, he was, I mean, fired. Sorry, can you repeat your answer again? He fired some people, but he was also fired. While we stayed. Who were the people he fired? Uh, if I don't forget, it was uh, Baba Drame was one of them. Uh, Momodu Sane, Small was fired, but Small later, they later brought Small back. I might forget some of the names actually, but uh, about five people were fired. But the, but the list that he came with included myself, Ibrahim Jaumani, Lamin Diba, uh, Small Sane, we call him Momodu Sane. Uh, we have uh, Momodu Sonko. Uh, some of these people were lithographers and uh, pro, uh, at the production department. Do you know the source of that list? Uh, actually, no. But I believe it came from the. Uh, the board of directors. And why do you believe that it came from the board of directors? Because normally they, they will give the directives or who stay and who 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 gets who will get fired. Can you please tell us about the editorial policy of the observer under the leadership of Dr. Sajatal? So under the leadership of Dr. Sajatal. He said, I, I remember the, he said to us that, I mean, uh, he, if anybody doesn't want to comply to what he has said, the door is opened. You can leave honorably. Because he was fired twice by President Jack and would not allow it to happen again. And in that sense, he says to us, if anybody, before anybody sacrifice him to be sacked as the manager of Observer, he'll make you are, you are sacked first. And what did you take that to mean? Oh, uh, we mean we know that he was very serious about it. So when we, pro, I mean, published some article that didn't go well with him, he will come and then will make a big noise of it. I mean, when he tried to fire you, the deputy director at the time and will always intervene, say, please give them chance, give them the second chance. Can you tell us about these incidents? Uh, one of the incidents was, the major incident that happened at that time was during the AU summit. When the Ibrahim, Chief Ibrahim Mamani was reported by Dr. Sijatal to the NIA and he got arrested. How do you know that Dr. Sajatal was the one that reported Chief Ibrahim Amani? Dr. Sajatal uh, was informed by Pamalik Fai, one of our news editors, that he, Dr. Tal, entrusted me and my colleague, that is Ibrahim Jaumani, Lamin Diba, and others, that we should run the Daily Observer newspaper 
But he came across something on our international page and he stopped it because he wants to be in the good books of Dr. Sejatal at the time. So they discussed this. They discussed this at the one of the uh, gas stations on Fajara Road as Shell. And one of their workers, no Ibrahim Jaumani, he called Ibrahim Jaumani and informed him that your managing director was here with one of your colleagues. And he, report, he I heard him talking about you, Jaumani, Lamindeba, Usman Dabo, and others, that you have allowed Chief Mani to download something from the internet and uh, he is going to report you to the NI. So before they came back to the office, we were informed. Can you tell us what it was that Chief Mane downloaded from the internet? Chief Ibrahim Mane downloaded uh, about the foreign African foreign ministers who were in the Gambia to attend the AU summit that they are supposed to meet to discuss about uh, to discuss on a charter of good governance and democracy in Africa. And in that article that was, I mean, the, uh, published by Elizabeth O'Haney of the BBC newspaper, sorry, BBC radio, I mean, indicated that the host, the, the host, that is Yaya Jame, the host I mean, meeting came to power through a coup d'etat together with many of his peers. And I still, I still have the article here with me. Thank you very much. Um, can you please make an undertaking to scan the page that you're referring to and send it to us? Yes, I can definitely do that. Can you please tell us about the title of that particular article and the date of the article itself? The date of the article was on Friday, 30th June 2006, on page Daily Observer. AU to discuss democracy charter. Sorry, Mr. Davo, can you please repeat yourself because you were breaking us, you were saying it. The article was dated 30th June 2006 of the Daily Observer, page 5 of the World News, and it's, the headline was AU to discuss democracy charter with a picture of Yahya Jame. That particular art article, was it picked up from the internet verbatim and placed in the Observer paper, or was it was it cited by Chief Mane in his article? Okay, we all have a responsibility at the Daily Observer at the time to make our work easy for us. So Chief Ibrahim Mane was the one responsible for download for the international pay column. So he will go to the internet and get some stories that he feel like they are deemed for public consumption. He will, I mean, download it and uh, lay it out on the Daily Observer World News column. So it was an article that was just being downloaded from an international media and put verbatim in the international space of the Daily Observer, right? Yes. Was that article eventually published? Actually, it was printed by the Observer, but it was never made public. It was never made public. Because we feel that the story would not go well with Dr. Sejatal, knowing for the fact that and his agenda of promoting Jamis welfare and that of the APRC, we feel that, I mean, this story might not go well with it. So we decided as a, as a team to take that uh, portion from the from the from the daily observer i mean publication so we went to the production department to find out whether it has been printed so the head of the print uh, the printing department told us that they have already i mean printed the, the page about 200 2500 pages have been i mean uh, uh printed we told him that well we want to cancel that page we have we came with another story and that what we're going to use that so we decided to put this, I mean, uh, international page into our store so nobody could have access to it. 
When you say we, who are you referring to, please? That's the editorial board of the Observer. Can you please name the people that were on the editorial board of the Observer? At that time, it was myself, Pamali Fai, Ibrahim Jaumane, uh, Lamin, Lamin Diba, and I think uh, one of your co the commissioner, Mustafa Ka, was one of our proofreaders at that time, if I didn't forget. Mustafa Ka, the com one of your commissioners, with uh, Thomas Kojo, uh, Sidi Bojang, we are also part of the proofreaders. They were the proofreaders. Were they necessarily part of the editorial board? Not actually. Thank you very much. This thing that you're telling us, was it before or after Chief Manes' arrest? Okay, when this uh, article was, I mean, printed, it was never made public. At that time, Chief was not arrested. We called him and informed him that we want to take this story out and put another story there, in which he agreed. You also told us that Dr. Sajatal was the one that report, reported chief. Can you tell us how he reported him? When Dr. Sajatal came to the Daily Observer with Pamali Fai, he met with my one of my uncles and he called him and says, Mr. Dabo, with this paper in his hand, he got it from the, uh, uh, from the store, our store, our Observer store. He said to me, I entrust this paper to you, but on the whole, you are stabbing me on my back. This was, I mean, the, uh, printed, and you guys decided to keep it away from me, away whom I did not trust, whom I called as a griot, was the one who informed me about this. I'm going to call Captain Lamin Sen to arrest all the editorial members, and by the time the, he's through with you guys, you're going to say who, I mean, the who was the one responsible for this article. As at this time, did you already decide that you will not publish this particular article? Yes, we already decided that we are not going to make it public. And we did not make it public, we just kept it in our store. So, between the time Dr. Tal told you that he will report the editorial board to Captain Sen and the time Chief Mane was arrested. Can you please tell us the time frame? Uh, when this article was uh, written on Friday the 30th, on Saturday we were at the office and uh, we saw two plainclothes officers. One was like, one was uh, one whom I know was uh, Sirif, C, Sirif C. We call each other general because he used to be at the major crime unit of the police. He was also a CID officer and later went to the Interpol department. He was attached to our office with another officer and told us that I'm looking for chief money. I said, before he asked for chief money, I told him, General, what are you doing here in my office? He said, we are here for a mission. I said, are you here to arrest somebody? He said, no, 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 we're here to ask somebody some questions. So he asked for chief money. Then I asked, uh, if I remember, I called them to, I told him chief money is in the uh, computer room. So the chief was called out, and uh, she told him that he is needed for questioning at Bagdad. We told him that the chief Mr. is going, every one of us has Sorry, w once again, can you please repeat yourself? You said right. you told him that Chief Mane is in the computer room. Thereafter, what happened? Thereafter, we called Chief, and Chief came to answer to him. He told Chief Mane that... He is needed at Bakau police station for questioning. So we asked in regards to what? They never reveal. So we said, then you have to take all of us then if you are going to uh, pick chief money. Well, we know, actually they were there because of the fact that Dr. Sajatal told us that he's going to report the matter to Captain Lamin Sen in connection to with, uh, this article. So we knew that he's going to be arrested. So he told, chief told us that, no, it's okay. I can go by myself. Then we advise him to put his phone on so we can be in communication with him. So they took him to Bagao Police Station. Bagao Police Station. And after several hours, 
We could not hear from Chief. We called him and the phone was switched out. Then we decided to go to the uh, Bago police station to ask for him. At first, they insisted that they told us that I mean, Chief Mane was never at Bago police station. So we stayed there. We said Chief was arrested by Sirif C and another guy whom I don't know. And they told us that they are bringing him here. So when we stood there after several hours, they told us that Chief Mane, yes, he was, he was arrested, but he's taken to the NIA. This Sheriff C that you're talking about, do you know which security outlet he worked for? He was a plain court officer from the police department. Currently, when I was in the Gambia last January and February, I do see him at the Denton Bridge. What does he do at the Denton Bridge? I know he's still a police officer in a plain clothes. But uh, I don't know whether he's under the traffic now or not. But he's stationed at, uh, at, the, at the police station in, uh, at the Denton Bridge. When you received the news that Chief Mane was taken to the NIA, did you go there to find out if he was there? Yes, we tried there several times. And then any time we go there, they'll tell us that he is never there. But because that's the routine of the NIA. That's the operando. They will always tell you that we don't arrest this person. Even when I was arrested, one of my sister came there to look for me. He asked, she asked uh, Salimina Drame, sorry, uh, Salimina Drame, whether I've been picked up. And Salimina lied to him that, to her that I was arrested. So that's their mode of operando. When they told you that he was not there, did you further inquire about his whereabouts? Yes. We did, and uh, we continue. And uh, Point newspaper, and I believe Foraya, they published an article of his arrest. As at the time of Chief's arrest, was the management there? That is, uh, Dr. Sajatal, was he present? Yes, the man. Yes, Sajatal was present actually. So anytime I do an investigation on uh, Chief Ibrahim Amane, I will send my report to the Point newspaper on a pen name, Nyakasi Jame. I use this last uh, Jame's last names just to frustrate Yaha Jame because he wouldn't believe that a Jame last name will go and I mean, uh, be critical of his government. So I always try to use a pen name with the last name of Jame. Why not Daily Observer? Why send it to other papers? The Observer newspaper will, not, will never publish it. Sajata will never allow us to publish anything about Chief Mane. You mentioned that you did some investigations with respect to Chief Mane. Can you please tell us about the investigations, just step by step, where you started and where you ended with the investigation? I started from my inside sources from the NIA, and they confirmed to me that Chief was indeed there at one time. I mean, but they moved him to mile two. So we couldn't access mile two because he was uh, kept incommunicado. I one day went to the police headquarters in Banjul, and I was informed by a senior police officer who later became an uh, inspector general of police. He was a human rights lawyer, uh, prosecutors too, told me that he got information from human rights organizations that Chief Mane was detained at Sibanur police station. Can you please tell us the name of the senior police officer? It was uh, former IGP Landing Kinte. Did you do then anything with deputy respect to the information you received from Mr. Kinte? Yes, when I received this information, I came and I informed Dr. Sejatar. Because, I mean, as the months passed by, one day, Dr. Tal told me that he couldn't sleep when the memories of Chief Mane clicked into his head. He, or he thinks of, I mean, the, seeing the ghost of Chief Mane. So when I came and informed him that uh, I was told by a senior police officer that Chief Mane was detained at Sibano, he told me to go and find out. I went to Sibano, 
But upon arrival at Sibano, the police told me, yes, he was the he's going to call Dr. Tal and informed him accordingly. But I didn't tell him I was going to go to was at again I become suspicious that maybe he's alerting the police that I was doing an investigation. Upon arrival at Sibanor, sorry. Upon arrival at Sibanor, which police officer did you speak to? I don't know them actually. I don't know those officers. I told them that I was there to find out about a friend and a colleague, Chief Mane, who I was told was detained by them there. Sorry. Was it at Sibanor police station or somewhere else? It was Sibanor police station. I went to. Then from Sibanor police station, I went to Gunjur. Gunjur too, they told me that he was there briefly, but was taken away. Where in Gunjur did you go? At Gunjur police station. Did they give you any details apart from the fact that he was here and they've taken him away? No, they didn't give me any fact. They didn't give me any other information. And where did they say they took him to? They said they don't know. So I came back. I also informed uh, even Lani Kinder again. I informed Sajar Tal and some of my colleagues. So while I was there, a colleague of us told us that, I mean, he goes with one NI officer. That NI is late. He's from uh, Kombo Dasilami. Uh, that they used to take, I mean, food to detainees at Bundung, behind the Bundung police station. That there is a compound seized by Yaya Jame, and they are detaining people there at that time. Which colleague of yours gave you this information? This was Mohamed Lamin Sane. We call him Small. That NI officer was a friend of his. And did you go to that place to inquire? I went to that place. He saw me that place. I went there to inquire, but I could not have access to get inside the compound. And I couldn't know who were the people detained there. Can you please tell us where this particular place is located in Bundung? It's like uh, before, like if you're coming from uh, Serekunda Market area towards Bundung, there is a Johnson there on the right hand side. You have to take that Johnson. It leads to you to a school. There is a middle school or a senior secondary school there. On the right hand side of the football field, there is Sorry? a compound there where they used to. Do you know the name of the school? The people. The name I don't of know the whether school. it's Mindao or what. I'm not too sure whether it's Mindao. Can you repeat the name? Mindao. Is it Mindao or Mindao? I forgot the name of the school. But there's a school there. It's a middle school. Okay, go ahead. So I went there, but I could not have access to get inside the compound. Can you tell us what you observed when you went to that place? The security officers sitting by the gate will be doing attire there. And uh, you can hear voices, but I mean, see them. What kind of voices can you hear from there? Uh, voices of the security officers who are, I mean, stationed there. Because they normally take, they, according to the, uh, the sources, they normally uh, have a routine where they will switch, I mean, security officers to be stationed there. And they are always in, in, in Mufti, in camouflage. They never put on any uniform. Did you have an interaction with any of the police officers that you saw there? No, I could not. I did not have any interaction with them. Thereafter, did you have any clues leading to the whereabouts of Chief Mane? Yes. After that, a colleague of mine who worked with the Foreign News Panfa was also doing some investigations about Chief Mane. Sorry, can you please repeat the name? Yeah, yeah, Danfa. Go ahead, please. Yaya was also doing investigations on Chief Mane. And uh, when we got the information that Chief was moved to Fatoto Fato Police Station in Upper River Region, Yaya and the Amnesty International personnel 
travel to Can you please repeat your statement? You said Yaya and the other Amnesty International personnel traveled. Traveled to Fatoto. Okay. To find out whether Chief Mane was indeed uh, been detained there. And what did they find out? Damfa, when they arrived at Chief at Fatoto, between the hours of two o'clock to three p.m., he saw Chief Mane. So, uh, after being after eating his lunch, he was escorted by the police to his cell. So he rose to the police station and told them that he was there to look for Chief Money. They told him that Chief was never there. He insisted with the Amnesty International personnel that Chief was there because they saw him going in school with him, escorted by the police. But they denied that he was there. And eventually, they were arrested and taken to uh, Banyun Police Headquarters. Yaya Damfa, did he walk closely with Chief Mane? Uh, not actually. He doesn't walk closely. He walked with, at the time, he retired from the army and became a journalist with Foraya newspaper. Did he personally know Chief Mane? Yes, he knows Chief Mane. So he would recognize him when he sees him anywhere? Oh yes, definitely he will. He knows him very well. Did Diaya tell you the state in which Chief, Dampa, Chief Mane was when he saw him? Yes, because myself and Yaya went to the international court. So Yaya told me that Chief Mane was not in a good condition at the time he saw him uh, after having his lunch at Fatodo Police Station. What do you mean by not in a good condition? Like he was kind of weak. Because we know him, he was very, I mean, healthy and very strong. But he was kind of weak. During his detention, in, because you mentioned that Yaya and the Amnesty International personnel were also detained. During their detention, did they have any interaction with Chief Mane? No, they wouldn't have any interaction with Chief Mane, where they were also arrested and escorted to Banyun Police Headquarters. Apart from that incident, did you receive any other clues as to the whereabouts of Chief Mane? No, I did not receive any clue, but they t later, I mean, the, within that period, his elder brother, Lamin Babai Mane, came to the observer office and asked Dr. Sejatal, about the whereabouts of Chief Ibrahim Omani. And what was the response of uh, Dr. Tal about the whereabouts of Chief Mane? Uh, when Lamin Baba Mane came, Lamin Baba Mane was a retired, uh, sorry, was a, a convict by the German administration for alleging that he was part of the November 11 coup d'etat and he was sentenced to nine years imprisonment. So his, after his imprisonment, when they, were, when they were released from prison, I was one of the journalists who interviewed them. And uh, he came to the office. We recognized each other and asked for Dr. Sejatal. I took him to Dr. Tal's office. But the, uh, it didn't go well. So they had I mean, arguments and Sejatal kicked him out of the office and informed the security that he never wanted to see anybody from Chief Mane's family to be at the office. Between the time Chief was arrested and the time his brother came to the office, can you estimate the time for us? Uh, it was like uh, three or four days later he came to the office. Apart from Chief Mane's brother, did anyone else come to the office to inquire about him? Yes, he, his father came there too to ask about Chief Mane. And what happened when he came? When he came there, he, I mean, he had some I mean, words with Chief Mane, uh, Dr. Tal. And Dr. Tal told him that he was arrested by the NIA. Did you speak to the father when he came to the office? 
Yes, I did. Can you tell us about your interaction with him? When I met with the father, we spoke briefly, and I told him that, let's assure that we're going to do our investigations. We are not going to let, let, let it die like that. And we are working tooth and nail to know the whereabouts of Chief Money. Then I briefed him about our investigation from Bakao Police Station to Banjul and to Sibano and other places. So then and later I became a family fr uh, close friend to the family. Did you eventually find out where Chief Mane was? After uh, Danfa and the Amnesty staff were arrested, they moved uh, Chief Mane from Fatoto to Sarangai. How did you know about this information? We've been informed by some police officers who were not who were not happy about his arrest and detention because he has never been charged and he's been moved from one police station to the other. And they feel that that was very wrong. Can you please tell us the police officers that gave you this information? Uh, actually, it, uh, at Sarangai, there was a police officer who was stationed there. If I didn't forget, the last name was Sar. So when I got the information, I got, tried to get the number for Sarangai, called there, and uh, at that time, they confirmed that Chief was detained in Sarangai. And we, we wrote an, I wrote an article again, if I don't forget, on the Point newspaper with Nyakasi Jami again. And what was stated in your article? That he was, uh, according, I, we just say sources because we cannot, I, I mean, identify the, 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 our sources, I mean, name at that time because we know the, uh, the Jamis administration's uh, type of rule. So we just say sources, I mean, reveal that he was moved from Fatoto to Sarangai and it has been confirmed by police. So when we did that was confirmed, we went to the police, at the then the police PRO. I think it was, uh, as is jam as is Bojam, if I don't forget, the police be out at the time. And uh, Mr. Bojam is so close, Chief Man was very close to Chief uh, Asis Bojam. Was some of those police officers who are very nice people, Asis Bojam, Pa Jallo, Brahma Diba, and others. I mean, they were very I mean resourceful to the media. So he said he couldn't uh, confirm that Chief was I mean at Sarangai. But I mean, with the mode of operando, we actually. He was there, but they were farming to us because nobody wants to be in the net of Yaya Jami at that time. Apart from the work that you did, the investigation work that you did, trying to locate the whereabouts of Chief, do you know if anyone or any organization did anything to find out his whereabouts? Uh, reporters without uh, journal, uh, is it reporters without borders. We are doing their investigations. Amnesty International, almost uh, the CPJ Community to Protect Journalists. These were all. I mean the the Media Foundation for West Africa. These were all. I mean the media companies who were vigorously attacking Jammy to produce Chief Money dead or alive. But I mean the Gambia government never adhered to this. So after one of my trip from Nigeria. I mean, when I came home, I got the information that he was admitted to the uh, intensive care unit. I think this was in 2006, if I didn't forget. I think 2006. Then I called at the ICU, and it happened that a friend of mine, who was also a police officer and a police medic, Confirmed that chief was there, but he was moved away from there to the military uh, mil military medics unit. Can you please tell us the name of that friend that to told you that chief was there at the RVTH intensive care unit? I can't remember the last name, but it was Sajo. Can you please give us a detail so that we will be able to identify who this Sajo is, apart from working at the medic int intensive care unit? Did he do anything else? He was a police officer at the time. 
but he's been trained as a nurse from uh, I think Bansan. He too was trained as an SCN. Did you go to the military medical unit to find out if Chief Mane was there? Yes, I did. But I couldn't have access and they denied that he was there. Can you tell us who was in charge of the medic unit at that time at the military barracks? Uh, I'm not too sure, but at that time we have one judge who works there and Damfa was also there. And uh, a lady medic was also there too. You know the first name of Damfa? I'm not too sure whether it's Lamin or something. But it's a fair, a light skin, light skin, per, I mean, guy. And Jaju was, the, was also there at the time. Well, Jaju was the one who was going to Bajinka's house to treat uh, Sanamanja when he got born at the Independent. Do you know the first name of Jaju? No. But on their uniforms, their, la their last name was written there. Can you describe this Jaju you're talking about? Jaju is almost the same height with me. And uh, I know he's from Fonyi, but which village, I don't know. But he's from Fonyi. But I believe if you ask the medics, they will know. Can you estimate his height for us? Uh, I could be six o, because I'm 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 six point I'm six o two. Did he have any distinctive future that sets him apart? Uh, he's not. I mean, he's just like athletical build. Apart from that, did you find out any other information about Chief Man? Uh, we were also informed again that he was, I mean, the, taken back to mile two. And uh, we couldn't confirm. But we were told that after mile two, he was moved to, uh, I don't know, Basse Police Station or Garawal, something. He died around that area. And we couldn't confirm to when we while he was seriously sick, he was beaten by the then go is it the the then uh, commissioner or governor at uh, URD. Can you please tell us who the governor was at that time at URD? I'm not too sure whether it was Omar Khan. Can you please confirm the date that Chief was arrested to the date that you last uh, heard an information about him? It was on the 7th of July, 2006. And when was the last information you heard about him? Uh, this was in 2007. Shortly before I left for the international court. And that is the information about him being at URD, right? Yes. And URD meaning Upper River Division, right? Yes. Yes. You mentioned that you went to ECOWAS court. Can you tell us the purpose for you going to the ECOWAS court? Uh, it was on, the, on a Wednesday. While working at the Observer, because when they when they knew that, I mean, I know a lot about uh, Chief Mane, and I've been following the case of Chief Mane very well. Dr. Sajatal was told that I should be a reporter at the State House on the Yajami. Posted it for 18 months. And uh, one of the NIS, who was double, he used to call me Mbadi. Mbadi means relative. Sorry, Mr. Dabo, can you please start from uh, when they know that you were investigating about Chief Mane? Dr. Sajatal told you that you should be an in a reporter attached to the State House. That's where we stopped. The rest we couldn't yes. hear. Yes, yeah. yes. Can you I please was attached to State House. 
sorry. I was arrived to State House as a reporter to cover the daily activities of President Yaya Jame. So they will deter me from going to the international court. And I will be, I won't have the time to talk to the international media because I was interviewed by BBC at one time about Chief Manis issue. And during the uh, World Press Freedom Day at Alliance Franco, I made myself clear and I revealed Chief Manis arrest there and his movements. So while I was out, an NIA officer, the last name is Dabo, I think he's from Sukuta. He will call me Mbadi, means relative. You gotta be careful. You have been sent here as a sacrifice from the observer, where they know your activities involved in locating Chief Ibrahim Mane. So my advice to you is to leave this country immediately if you can. But I insisted that it's okay, I'll be fine. And he'll give me his worldly advice that I should be then be very careful who I talk to while I'm at State House in Banyo. And for how long did you remain at the State House? I remained at State House for almost 18 months. And we do spend the weekend in Canila. You mentioned that at one point you were you were taken to go testify at the ECOWAS court. Can you please tell us about that? It was on a Wednesday after my uh, coverage at State House. I was I received a telephone call from Senegal by Steve Bojan Jr. who told me that there is a big opportunity here. Can you please come right now? With it? I told him no, I can't do that. I'm a family man. So I cannot just leave my family here like that and travel to Dakar. So I insisted for him to tell me the opportunity. Then he said, are you safe to talk to me where you are? And I answered yes. He told me that we need you to go and testify at the media found at the, at the ECOWAS court on the issue of Chief Ibrahim Mane. But I'm scared to tell you this on the phone for the fact that the Gambia is not a safe and uh, you have been watched closely. I told him, okay, what is, I wouldn't mind to come. But what we can do is, if a lady friend of yours is there, at that time, Sejatal was fired as the director of Zava, and Dida Halake was the one appointed. So I told him to use a lady to call Dida Halake and inform him that that lady was the secretary to the Gambian High Commissioner in Dakar that I am invited to attend a conference, a two-day conference, which he agreed. And a lady friend who our, happens to be our auntie, we call her auntie, spoke with Dida Halake, but at one time Dida was saying no because Usman has to be in Kanila on Friday to cover the, an activity of the president. But was told that two days there and they're going to pay my flight back on Friday early morning. But we, three of us knew that uh, that was fake. We're just trying to make sure that I lived the country safely without them being know that I'm going to testify at the Equus Court. And did you eventually succeed in going to the Equus Court and testifying? Yes, I went, but before I left, I spoke to a, uh, a judge, a high court judge in the Gambia at the time, and uh, a senior, uh, a friend of mine, a civil aviation, to look after my family while I'm away. While you were away, did your family remain in the Gambia? On Thursday, I had a meeting with Sri Bojan Jr. together with uh, Amijuf Cole. And uh, Professor Kwame Karikari called from Ghana, from Dagol. When I spoke with them, at first I was reluctant to go for the fact that I left my family behind. At that time, my wife just delivered my twins, who were barely old. So I was reluctant to go, but when I think of it, 
I said, if I don't do it for Chief Money, who is going to do it? Who is going to be the next culprit of Yaya Jame if we don't stand firm to defend our fellow journalists? So I agreed that I'll be going. Then I have a friend of mine in, uh, who works at Civil Aviation. I called him if he can give some money to my uh, family so they can leave the Gambia safely. So I sent uh, a neighbor to him. He gave that neighbor $10,000 to give it to my wife, who then went to the immigration. I also called an uh, immigration officer and uh, a senior police officer to help me facilitate my family to get a passport to leave the Gambia. So it was on a Friday. They went to uh, get a passport. And my wife and the twins, where I happened to get the passport on time, then on uh, she went to my family in Barcote, informed them that I said she need to meet me. In, but I didn't tell them actually what was going on. I just told them that I had a job. So I want my family to join me there. But they were scared. Actually, when my wife told them that, I said, let her meet me in Dakar with the kids. So they left Gambia on a Saturday. And that very Saturday, when they arrived in Dakar, I already left for Nigeria. The disappearance of the arrest and the disappearance of Chief Mane. Can you please tell us if it had any impact on you and your fellow journalists? It really impacted us greatly because we were all putting at the back of our mind that any one of us could be the next target. Any one of us can disappear like Chief Money. Any one of us can be killed by Data Hydra, like Data Hydra. So we always try to be at least a step ahead of those uh, Jame and his, I mean, uh, men. So we always try to be one step ahead of them. The court proceedings that you attended at the ECOWAS court, can you please tell us what the outcome of it was? After my testimony, together with Yaya Damfa at the ECOWAS court in Nigeria, we went back to our hotel. Then uh, Professor Kwame Karikari, who was the CEO of Media Foundation for West Africa, joined us in Nigeria. We all stayed in the same hotel. He told us that he's going to take us to uh, Ghana to be working on the Foundation for West Africa. Because he feel that, I mean, it is not safe for we to return to Gambia. Can you and tell us the outcome with... of the case with respect to the disappearance of Chief Mane? It was until after the, uh, our testimony, the Gambia government was fined to pay Chief Mane's family 100,000 US dollars. That was the verdict of the Equus Court. Do you know if the Gambian government took any steps to investigate the disappearance of Chief Mane? No, they did not. Thank you very much, Mr. Davo, for answering all of my questions. And thank you for being patient and uh, waking I, up early in I the add, morning. Can I add something there? Yes, sir. After our testimony, while my family was in Dhaka for four months, they joined me in, in Ghana. I spent nine months in Ghana. While I was in Ghana, I received information that the Jammeh administration declared me wanted and that I was the one who informed the Ghanaian government about the killing of the 44 Ghanaians. So I stayed in Ghana for nine months before being uh, relocated to the United States. But during my stay there, the Media Foundation was very cautious of who I talk to and who visits me. So I don't have access to Gambians while I was there 
until maybe late, later in that year, that some of the students I'll meet are from Legon University and uh, who are Gambians, I will have some little time with them. But the issue is the 44 Guardians that were killed, we did publish an article on it. And uh, because when they, uh, they killed the seven people first and threw them at Tanje, by the Tanje seaside, where myself, Ibrahim Jaumane, with Aziz Bojang and others went there are seven bodies who were taken to the Royal Victoria post mortem to be conducted to find out the causes of their death. But one of them escaped, and he was in. He's a he was he's a Ghanaian who informed the Ghanaian government about the death of Chief Money. I never who informed the government about the death of the, those forty-four Ghanaians. Thank you very much, Mr. Dabo, for that additional invest for that additional information. This is a matter of interest to the commission. The Commission will look into this matter, and if need be, you will be further consulted on it as well. Thank you very much. Now I'll hand you over to the Chairman and the Commissioners for further questioning. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Council, and uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Dabo, for your testimony, and uh, really appreciate you uh, getting up very early in the morning. Uh, Seattle is what, seven hours, some uh, uh, time difference between Seattle and Banjul. But thanks again very much, Emma, for your testimony. Commissioners, do you have Thank any you questions? So much, Commissioner Kinte, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Usman Dabo. Thank you, sir. Uh, you told us that. Um, Chief Mane was later finally taken to URR, but you weren't sure whether it was Basie Police Station or Garawal Police Station. Yes. Uh, could you be of any help That's true. So, so that we establish uh, his last point of uh, where he was last seen or last known to be? That was a uh, Basse police station, and that was slapped by the then governor of that place, or the commissioner, which I believe it was Omar Khan. And uh, Chief Mane was said to be buried in, uh, I think, Diabugu or somewhere, uh, Diabugu or Gambisara, he was buried at. Diabugu or Gambisara. Yeah. But around a police station, is it? It was, it was Basse police station that he was last seen, and but the barrier he was buried around uh, the Abugo. Was... Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, um, uh, Mr. Tabo, would you have any concluding remarks to make? If you do, please proceed to make him now. Yes. Good morning from Seattle. And good afternoon to all Gambians. We have seen what the Gambia and the Gambians have gone through during the 22 regime of Yahya Jame, 22 years regime of Yahya Jame. My advice to all Gambians is to remain united. Let's see ourselves, let's see our country first. We need to work hand in hand to make so that the Gambia become a better place of living. To make so that the Gambia, the tyranny rule that we encountered for 22 years, will not be something that will emerge in the Gambia again. As Gambians, we need to see our first than our individual interest. I would urge the Gambia government to put in place a term limit of the president's flu in the Gambia. We need to make sure that democracy flourishes in the Gambia. Let people have the right to support any political party of their choice. Let people have the right to demonstrate. 
without asking for a permit. Let people have the right to religion of worship. Let us have the right to assemble without fear in our hearts. Let the police and the security apparatus of the Gambia know that Gambia is bigger than them and they should treat all civilians, irrespective of their political affiliation or religion, to treat us as one family, to treat us as brothers and sisters, to make sure that the Gambia, we all live in a very conducive environment without fear and we have to assemble. The Gambia government should make place should put in place to make sure that Gambia is for Gambians and no country can develop Gambia for us without we the Gambians. Let us also be careful the use of the social media. Many Gambians are abusing the social media a lot by tarnishing each other's image, fighting one another, causing one another. This is not something we should encourage. The social media is here to connect us as brothers and sisters and as one family. We need to refrain from character assassination just because you just have a hatred against somebody. Let us be careful. The use of our social media is affecting our marriages, is affecting, is affecting our culture as Gambians. We need to make sure that Gambia is for Gambians and is Gambia we should unite and develop. And I thank you very much for this opportunity given to me to come and testify before TRRC. Thank you very much again indeed, Mr. Dabo. Uh, Council, if we don't have any more witness for this afternoon, we will call it um, a day and uh, meet again tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. sharp. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.